friends, welcome back to MBM Online. I'm Josie and this is Rob and we're so glad that you've joined us. Uh, we want to say a special welcome if this is your first time joining us online and we'd love to hear from you and get to know you a bit and to do that you can use the get in touch link which is just below. Yeah. Hey Rob, how have you been? Been pretty good, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just I've been telling a few people that mm. I'm starting to feel like this current scenario just feels a little too normal. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure other people, it, you know, feels completely odd but just kind of going through the motions of coming to work, going mm. home, crazy stuff with the kids. They've started waking up much earlier these days, <laughs> much more why, but it just oddly feels normal. It's been like yeah. two months in lockdown. Uh, weird. Yeah. Mm. I don't know why. Yeah. What about Yeah. Mm? Um, I think it is feeling a bit normal, but I am feeling like that tiredness of yeah. yet another week in lockdown. It's been hard. Yeah. yeah. But I think I've been, we've been trying to do some new and fun things together to cool. try and keep our energy up. What, have you been trying anything? Yeah, similar? yeah, I did something the other day. We, yeah, I found some old bricks in the backyard mm. and I thought I'd set up a fire pit. And so we set up this fire pit and I, I think I had a fire going for like three days straight, nonstop. I just kept putting wood in. <laughs> I'm chopping wood down from the trees in the backyard. I'm finding wood anywhere. I found a couple of logs on the side of the road the other day. I picked them up. Uh, it just really made us feel like we were somewhere else. Yeah. Like, you know, the normal things wasn't happening. Mm. And even Sally said, I feel like I've, I've had a little bit of a holiday almost sitting next to this fire. We had the kids in the backyard mm. with marshmallows around the fire. That mm. was their first time. So that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What, like, what yeah. Have you been doing? We had an indoor picnic last weekend right. uh, it kind of made us feel like we were out on a date even though we were still just at home yeah, yeah. would you like put the rug out yeah we're out on the carpet grazing boards even open some champagne like wow yeah. okay yeah. Wow. <laughs> interesting uh that's awesome i don't know what you've been up to i'm sure life has just been either a mess or you're trying to manage in any way but a uh, number of things coming up in our community, things that we're helping you kind of get on board with and feel a little bit more normal. Mm -hmm. uh, belonging is one of the things coming up uh, in the in next week. Uh, so um, if you've been around with us for a little while, if you're new with us and, and really uh, feeling somewhat disconnected and you haven't yet found your way into the life of our church, belonging is the thing for you. And uh, that's coming up on Monday. Uh, Monday night goes for three weeks. It's uh, 7 p.m., um, uh, you, you'll get the link sent to you if you just hit get in touch we'll get you the link and you can uh, just jump on there we'd love to see you there it really will help you uh, find your place with us at MBM and feel more at home mm. and an announcement especially for the women or guys with women in their lives our women's conference is happening in just two weeks time on September 4th which is a Saturday uh, we're going to be looking at God's glory and how it never fades uh, and thinking about what that means for us as women and, uh, yeah, how that refreshes us and just amazes us at who God is. Uh, so that's coming up. I'll be there. And if you register now, you'll even get a online the conference pack sent to you before we're online. Yeah. Awesome. It'd yeah. be really cool. So, yeah. sal has been preparing some of that stuff with the yeah. team. Sounds very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, we're continuing in our series in Timothy, 1 mm. Timothy, and really thinking about uh, the foundations of church and what it looks like to live as God's people, mm. as God's family in the church. And today, uh, Dan Lee is going to help us think about truth and how truth matters not only in how we hear it, but actually how we live it out. And so mm. truth lived out is foundational and so important, not only for us in the church, but also for a watching world. Mm. So uh, looking forward to that. Uh, before we get anywhere else, we're going to stop and come before God in prayer. So yeah. uh, join us in praying. Uh, Father, we are so thankful that uh, we get to continue hearing your word uh, read and taught uh, by this online uh, presence. Uh, we thank you that uh, although uh, we're in a just a strange time of life, uh, that you have continued to keep us connected uh, through things like the internet and through Wi-Fi and through all these different uh, mediums. We thank you we still have this opportunity. Uh, but we, we recognize, Lord, that um, we are in this state, the, the brokenness of our world, uh, because of the brokenness of ourselves and our sin and the things that our sin have done in the world in that way. And we want to come before you and, and recognize that and, and say we are sorry. We're sorry for the way that we've treated you. We're sorry for the way we've treated others. We're sorry for the way we've treated even ourselves and the bodies that you've given us. But we are also so thankful that you haven't left us in this state, that you've given us your only son, our Lord Jesus, who was willing to give up everything to enter into our brokenness, our broken world, and be broken himself on the cross that we might know you 
and no life. And so we thank you so much for that. And Lord, we want to bring all these things before you, the brokenness. We want to bring the COVID situation before you and ask that you would have your hand over it, keeping us safe and keeping us, uh, giving us wisdom to navigate our, our lives at the moment. And we want to especially bring before you the, the situation going on in Afghanistan mm-hmm. and the lives of all those who are now being attacked and even killed uh, by the Taliban. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, let your spirit do his work in that place, that you would be changing the hearts of those who are attacking people, that you would enable them to hear truth, to hear the, the words of Jesus, to respond to him and actually to change it, to stop and to turn their lives over to you. But we also ask for those who are being put to death, especially the Christians in that place who are being uh, uh, martyred for your sake, that you would be with them, remind them of your presence, remind them of their hope. And uh, Lord, we, we ask that you would put a stop to all that mess happening over there and help us here as we, we see and hear those things happening to find ways that we can support, you know, whether that is by praying or others. Mm. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, we also want to lift up to you our Year 12 students. Uh, Lord, we know this has been a really tough year for them in their learning. uh, And we think of them especially at the moment as a lot of them are starting their trials. Uh, Lord, we pray um, that through this year, they would be reminded that their greatest hope is in you, um, that they would find their identity and their worth uh, in what Jesus has done for them. Uh, And Lord, we do pray uh, for rest and comfort in this time, um, for, uh, yeah, good study as they enter their trials um, and that they'd come out of this year loving you more. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bed I've held everything together and watched it shatter I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender Chased my heart at a drift and drifted home again Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still Yeah. 
don't deserve this kind of love Somehow This kind of love is who you are It's a grace I could never add up To be somebody you still want Somehow You love me as you find me Everything made by God is good. Everything made by God should be received with thanks. What might this look like for the child who follows Jesus? God made the world and everything in it. Everything made by God is good. God filled the world with wonderful things for us to eat and enjoy. From the fish that fill the sea to the animals that graze on the land, from the fruit that hangs from the trees, to the vegetables that grow beneath the soil, from the busy bees making sweet, sweet honey, to the beautiful butterflies helping trees to grow their fruit. Everything made by God is good. And as his children, we are to receive everything made by God with thanks. So, when we sit down to eat, we thank God for the food given to us today. When we look at our plate, at the food we like and the food we don't like, we thank God, whether it's time for vegetables or time for dessert. We thank God. Whether it's food we love made by mum or food from our neighbour that's a little strange and new. We thank God. Whether it's food we choose or food chosen for us, we thank God. Everything made by God is good and is to be received with thanks. So why do we pray before we eat? Because the food we're about to eat is given to us by our good and generous God. God didn't just give us a few things to eat. He gave us many, many different things to eat and enjoy. So, as his children, we enjoy God's gift of food, God's way. We receive it with thanks, knowing that everything that we're about to eat is given to us by our good, good God. Let's pray and thank him now. Father God, we thank you so much for all the delicious food that you give us. Help us to be thankful to the people that made it for us. Help us most of all to be thankful to you, the giver of all good gifts. Amen. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm here with Kim Morris, who's our Women's Pastoral Minister and also a counsellor. And we want to think just about this whole space that we're in at the minute. Um, Delta strain, we're in lockdown. Kim, this feels like, I keep hearing people say, this is like pandemic 2.0. There's a grief about this. We kind of thought we were getting somewhere and then we're going backwards now. Have you noticed people are feeling stressed? Yeah, people are definitely more stressed. Um, Some people would say they were more stressed the first time around and less so now, but really on the whole, people are more stressed, I think, this time around. That's what my experience has been. Um, Yeah, I think over the time of the pandemic, I've heard two really helpful analogies. Uh, One is uh, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. And that's true. Yeah, yeah, and maybe two marathons. Yeah, <laughs> and we feels that way. definitely, yeah. and we don't know where the finish line is, and that adds to the stress. Uh, the other one I heard a couple of weeks ago was, "We're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat." And I thought that was so fitting, uh, because some people are in a boat by themselves. Some people are in a boat with small children, and and they're quite there's a lot going on, and some people are just two people in the boat, like. It's all very different. Uh, And some people have uh, the resources they need and some people don't. And then there's some people are struggling with illness or mental health. And, yeah, it's very different for all of us. Yeah. So, Kim, if I'm putting along in my tinny, my little boat here, and it's got a leak, what would you say to me? Yeah. Look, I'd say contact people. Make sure that you're making a phone call, that you're going for a walk with someone and having conversation 
Uh, if you're not seeing your family, arrange a Zoom or a Zoom call or a, a FaceTime call uh, where you can see other people. And my family have just started doing trivia nights once a week. And at first it was a bit slow, but we're really getting into it now and right. that's lots of fun. Yep. Um, but the other, another thing is be outward looking. So try and think, uh, what can I do for someone else? So especially our neighbours, this is a great opportunity to reach out to our neighbours. Um, and uh, I was encouraged by you telling me the story that someone had given you yeah, a care package. Yeah, someone dropped us in a movie night care package. It was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So after I heard that, I did that. I, there was a neighbour that I'd had on my heart for some time but had done nothing, and they were blown away. And the thing about doing these random acts of kindness it's really good for us I mean it's good fun. Yeah. This is great the yeah. people actually are so blessed and love it um, it's great for connection but for us we it's actually really good for us as well so yeah that's a that's really important yeah. um, the other thing is check your mental health so you know how am I traveling am I okay Am I sleeping too much? You, you know, are there things you've noticed about your mental health that have changed? Mm. So it's about being self-aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and if you've noticed a change but it's not drastic, what do I need? What do I need right now to help me get get feeling a little bit better? Yeah. Um, if, I know it is, if it is drastic? If it is drastic, we go to the doctor. Okay. Yeah, please, please make sure you go to the GP for a mental health check, um, or even just for a chat if you're not sure. Don't don't hesitate. Um, it's it's the right thing to do, and we've got to take care of ourselves. Um, yeah, um, and the other thing is, a couples, uh, a, a lot of couples are both working from home at the moment, and that can be um, a lot of pressure when you're seeing each other 24 hours a day um, so make sure that you're talking issues through and make sure that you're planning a special night um, regularly so every week would be great if you could plan a special night whether that is playing a board game uh, making a nice cheese board making each someone a nice dinner um, whatever it is put the effort in be intentional and be intentional about getting out of your trackies and, you know, putting some aftershave oh. on or some perfume <laughs> and, you know, doing your hair and, you know, just make an effort. I had to order some new trackies <laughs> off eBay. Anyway, we won't go there. Um, Kim, hot tips for, you know, surviving lockdown. Yeah, hot tips. Exercise every day. Um, even half an hour walk is all you need to do. Uh, sit in the sun. Uh, the winter sun is beautiful. Go and sit in the sun with a cup of tea and just enjoy that. And the other thing is start a project. Um, paint a room, build a garden, you know, something where you can kind of invest in and you can see there's going to be an end point and an outcome that's going to make you feel good about what you're doing. Um, yeah, if, you, if it's just a hobby, go back to your hobby. Yeah, they're really important. Brilliant. Now, Kim, this is super hard for everybody, whether you're a Christian or not, yeah. but we're Christians. What resources have we got that we can, I guess, be thankful to God for and a yeah. real blessing? We've got God and we've got the Word of God, number one. We've got community. We've got church family. Uh, reach out to your church family. Make sure you're in a growth group um, and you're attending every week you know uh, if you want get a prayer partner that'll be awesome to have someone to pray for you and you pray for someone else um yeah i you know jesus in um in john 14 jesus is um telling uh, his his super stressed yeah, disciples yeah yeah super stressed jesus disciples jesus is about to die on them yeah like yeah. don't be troubled don't let your hearts be troubled do not be afraid and I think we need to remember that. Like God is with us in this storm. We are not alone. So, yeah, we need to hold tight to that. I'm um, into that. And remember too, if you're, you know, if your business is down, um, haven't got work, you're struggling, uh, there's anything we could help with, that care at mbm.org.au um, email as well. You can contact us on that. And if we can help, we'd love to. Kim, thank you so much, and um, we've got some good things to go ahead with there. That's brilliant. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Bartlett, and our family of five go to the 10.45 a.m. Rudy Hill service. Today, we're going to be reading from 1 Timothy 4, the whole chapter, 1 to 16. 
The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truth of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, and for this we labour and strive, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the saviour of all men, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters, give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Hi, MBM Online. My name's Dan, and uh, we're going to continue our journey through 1 Timothy, looking at chapter 4 today. Well, it seems that in life, the question that is always there before us is, who do you want to be? Uh, You know, as a kid, it was always, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, an author, a gymnast, a firefighter, a footy player. Uh, For me, in my kind of twisted logic, I wanted to be a bank manager. And uh, the the thinking was that if I was the bank manager, then I got to control all the money. It was there for me to spend however I wanted. Well, then at the end of high school, we get confronted with that decision again. Who do you want to be? Usually it boils down to whatever score we get out of 100. Uh, As we become adults, uh, that question begins to take on a different shape. Uh, Rather than people asking us who we want to be or what do we want to be, it's often asking ourselves, is this really what I want to be? Uh, I remember during second year university, uh, during the summer break, I did a six-week stint with an accounting firm as an auditor. And those six weeks were more than enough for me me to realize that auditing was not my cup of tea. And so I diverted and pursued human resources. Along the way, we're always forever asking this question, you know, is this the thing that I really want to be pursuing? Is this the the thing that I want to spend my time, my energy, um, or is there something else to chase instead? Well, 1 Timothy 4 is going to put before us something that is worth chasing after. 1 Timothy 4 verse 6 says this, If you point out these things to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Now, the word minister there in that verse, it's not talking about the paid minister like me or or the other staff here. No, Paul uses a different word, different from the word that is used for elder and deacon uh, and overseer that he used back in chapter 3. Uh, The word is literally servant. It's not a particularly impressive word, is it? After all, when was the last time you said that you aspired to be a servant? I've never said to any of my kids, you know, oh, that dream of becoming a gymnast one day, put that on hold and pursue being a servant instead. No, what does a servant do? Well, a servant serves. See, to be a servant, by its very definition, is to be someone who is not important at all. Things like power and position, fame and status, recognition, those things are off the table when it comes to being a servant, because a servant serves. A servant doesn't have things on their radar like, oh, you know, am I going to get recognized for the role that I do? Am I going to get appreciated? Is my reputation at stake here? No, because a servant serves. 
And in the age that you and I live in, where it's all about chasing after dreams and, and my freedoms and my rights, why would anyone want to aspire to be a servant? Especially a good servant at that. I mean, we know plenty of bad servants, lazy servants, indifferent servants, uh, servants who do more harm than good. Well, for, for us to be servants, we're to be servants of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, who, as we saw in the very first verse in this letter, Christ Jesus, who is our hope, who is our Lord, chapter 1, verse 2. The one who came into this world to save sinners, chapter 1, verse 15. The one who gave his life as a ransom for all, chapter 2, verse 6. There is no greater privilege, friends, than to be a servant of Christ Jesus. That's really what I want you to walk away with today. And so with that in mind, 1 Timothy 4 sets out essentially what good looks like. What a good servant of Christ Jesus looks like. And the answer is this, it's to be godly, to be godly. Paul will address what godliness looks like from all sorts of different angles here in 1 Timothy 4, but essentially godliness is this, it's code for living out the truths about Jesus. And especially in 1 Timothy 4, the focus is on not only our lips, but also our lives. That's godliness. Friends, if 1 Timothy has drilled in anything over the last few weeks, it's that the truth matters. But what matters just as much as truth is the way in which we live out the truth, how we demonstrate the truth. See, it's not enough just to speak the truth. No, no, no. God is interested in how we, how we show the truth, how good we show the truth is, uh, how on board we are with the truth. And we do that through things like our attitudes, our priorities, uh, what things we say yes to, what things we say no to. Uh, we do that both within the church, within the household of God, but also before a watching world. And so that's essentially what we have here in 1 Timothy 4. Now let's go back to verse 6. Let me read it again for us. If you point out these things to the brothers and sisters, you will be, not you might be, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. When it comes to what comes out of a servant's mouth, it's these things. Things that are useful for both men and women. Because remember, Paul doesn't want the women to miss out. No, he's jealous that they have every opportunity to learn. But what exactly are these things? Well, you look back through 1 Timothy and you realize that they're the sort of things that, chapter 1, that advance God's work by faith. They're the things that have love as its end point. They're the things that have to do with a purified heart, a clean conscience, a sincere faith. These things are the things that are the trustworthy sayings that are worthy and deserving of full acceptance. Things that that involve how Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, how there is one mediator between Christ, between God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ, that the task of pursuing an overseer is a noble task indeed. A good servant puts these things before God's family. And they do that because they're well aware of the times that we're living in. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, and things taught by demons. Notice how these things are contrasted by the things taught by demons. One promotes faith, the other one causes people to give up on Jesus altogether. And unlike a godly person who is on about truth, this demonic teaching, verse 2, comes from hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Whereas the godly person is all about trying to line up their walk and their talk, the hypocritical liar knows that the gap is massive and doesn't want to do anything about it. They not only don't speak the truth, they don't live it out as well. And it's not like they're trying to turn things around either. Uh, Their consciences are insensitive. They've been dulled. Rather than having their conscience pricked, they they don't give a stuff about telling the truth anymore. Well, come verse 3, we get a window into the sort of lies that these hypocritical lies are spreading. Verse 3, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Right, so the lie was this, that you were somehow more spiritual if you chose not to get married but to stay single. And if you didn't eat certain foods, well, then that made you holy. Well, we know that can't be right because God is pro-marriage. He's the one who invented it in the first place and gives it to us as a good gift. 
Jesus has declared all foods clean. So you can go right ahead and eat all the bacon, all the shellfish you want. Being godly doesn't mean pursuing the ascetic lifestyle, where we reject ourselves, reject ourselves, deny ourselves the very things that God has given us to enjoy. If you're not a Christian and you're tuning in today, number one, we are so glad that you are here. Number two, you may be thinking that there's no fun in Christianity whatsoever. That I have to give up the things that I enjoy if I want to follow with Jesus. Well, you will have to give up some things. But ultimately, you get now the privilege of thanking the God who gives you those good things to enjoy on his terms. Take a look at verse 4. For everything, everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Now, look, I get during lockdown, it can be a lot harder to find things to be thankful for. But you kind of sniff around long enough, you make that effort, and soon enough, things kind of bubble up to the surface. So let me rattle off a few things that I've been thankful for during this time. I'm thankful for technology, uh, things that enable us to stay in touch. I'm thankful for an oven. Uh, with cooking at home all the more. Uh, last lockdown, our oven was broken. And so now we actually get to enjoy some good home-cooked food, try out some new recipes. I'm thankful for the sunset I saw on the Rooty Hill the other day. There is a hill in Rooty Hill. I'm thankful for the bike that I can ride. And I'm thankful for these. I found these the other day at Audi. I'm thankful for strawberries that are at the moment only $2 a punnet. How good is that? How good is that? How good is it to be a Christian and know that we have someone who we can thank? Gratitude. That's what falls off the lips of a good servant of Christ Jesus. Well, that's one side of the going called godliness, what comes out of our lips. The other side has got to do with our lives. 1 Timothy 4 verse 7. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, Paul writes, train yourself to be godly. Now, notice here how godliness is contrasted with the false teaching that was all over running rampant in Ephesus or modern-day Turkey. And that contrast is really, really important because it shows us that godliness is always connected with truth. See, often I've made the mistake, and maybe you have too, in thinking that godliness equals goodliness, of simply doing the right thing, that godliness is all about morality. And I reckon we've kind of bought that lie because we've, we've kind of thought that it's all about what I do for God. You know, the good deeds that I present before God in that last day. Those are the things that will help me earn God's favor. That's what gets me into heaven. And then as long as on the balance of things that my good things outweigh the bad, well, then surely God will accept me. That would be your classic example of a godless myth that Paul says have nothing to do with whatsoever. No, godliness has got to do with truth. In fact, it's got to do with God. Uh, If you were to turn back to 1 Timothy 3.16, we were told about the secret of godliness. So the godliness has got to do not with the myths about God, but with truths about God. And Paul in chapter 3 rattles off six of them. That God appeared. He walked out of the grave, risen, alive, with real hands, real feet, real scars. And shortly after that, the Spirit confirmed that he was the real deal. That he was seen by angels. That he was to be preached to the ends of the earth so that people would believe in him. And now that he's been taken up in glory. Godliness begins and ends with having a firm grasp on who God truly is. And so on that basis, we're to train ourselves. Train yourself, Paul writes. Wow, if ever there was a time where that phrase took on fresh meaning, now would be it in the middle of a lockdown. Train. Not because you've got so much more time on your hands, although that might be true. No, train because of all the constant changes that are going on, the never-ending news feed, the things that make us feel depressed and disheartened, the things that cause us anxiety or fear or uncertainty, the things that cause us, uh, that, that, that's messing with our mental health at the moment or causing us into financial panic. Friends, now more than ever is the time to train. So make the extra effort. Discipline yourself. Roll up the sleeves. Grit the teeth, knowing full well that although it won't be easy, it'll be worth it. And not just train, but train yourself, Paul writes. We all know that the hardest person to lead is he yourself. But Paul wants us to feel the weight of responsibility that lies on our shoulders, that we're to be proactive and take the initiative on this one, that the buck stops with us. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you're all on your own, you know, on a deserted island. 
But yes, you are to take the initiative. And there are heaps of ways, Paul writes, um, heaps of ways um, to, as Paul writes in verse 6, to nourish ourselves on the truths of the faith. So let me ask you, what will training yourself to be godly, what will it look like in the week ahead? Well, to answer that question, I think you need to look at the week just gone. How did you go last week in nourishing yourselves with the truths of God's word? Once you've looked at that, why not this week try to set yourself a PB, a new PB, a personal best? So if it was zero times that you managed to open up God's word last week, that's fine. Why not aim for one time this coming week? Uh, If it was three times, why not aim for four? If you're used to reading a paragraph of the Bible each day, why not aim for a chapter? If you typically avoid reading the Old Testament, why not jump into a book of the Old Testament? Maybe you want to consider going things a bit deeper. Maybe you want to enroll in a course. Maybe you even want to think about Bible college in the future. More than happy to chat about some of those options. Wherever you are on that spectrum, keep on seeking to nourish yourselves on the truths of the faith. Now, of course, training isn't a solo thing. There's plenty of others who God has given us to walk alongside us in this training program, your small group being one of them. I remember hearing about one small group last year who, during lockdown, what they arranged was um, to Zoom together, but to actually turn the camera off and just have time where they themselves were reading the Bible. But the beautiful thing was they knew they were all doing it together. And that's kind of what inspired them to make the effort to be there. Um, It's been so encouraging to hear about the different ways that small groups have been seeking to live out the truths that they've been looking at. I heard of one small group, for example, who organized to deliver a whole bunch of groceries to someone who was doing it tough. I heard this week of how one group, the leaders, uh, organized to send out home-delivered supper to share in so as everyone uh, got around God's word. Now, that's a group to be part of, isn't it? Uh, Sending a bunch of flowers to someone who's doing it tough. I've heard of growth group members uh, contacting each other during the week. Friends, that is godliness in action. Word and deed, truth and love. So keep it up. Yes, train yourself, but train yourself along others, alongside others. Come verse 8, we come across another one of Paul's trustworthy say- sayings that's deserving of full acceptance. Let me read it. Verse 8. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Now, I know that a number of you watching, I know that a number of you already fully accept the first half of this saying. See, up until lockdown, you were already heading along to a gym. Uh, Maybe you were were training for a race. Um, Others of you were were walking, trying to get your 10,000 steps in each day. Many of you play competitive sports. And now in lockdown, I know that a number of you have jumped on that Couch to 5K app. To the notion that there is some value in physical activity, I know many of you are saying amen right now. Exercise is one of those wonderful gifts that God gives us that we saw earlier. But note, it's only of some value. Over my life, I've trained for a marathon. I've trained for a Spartan race. I've trained for plenty of basketball games. I've done time in the gym. I've uh, tried to look at what I eat. I've had plenty of physio along the way. Dragged myself out of the mo- out of bed in the morning. And you know what I've got to show with it? I mean, I absolutely don't regret one bit of it. It was lovely. I enjoyed it. But you know what I've got to show with it? Well, from the Spartan race, all I've got to show for is this headband. That's it. <laughs> that is it. This will get tossed someday and it'll be lost. And Oh, and a sermon illustration. That's the other thing I've got from this, from, from that, that Spartan race. Friends, godliness is the currency of heaven. Godliness is our future. Godliness is worth the effort, worth the strain, worth the sweat that you put in right now. You're getting a head start on what awaits in eternity. And just as much as you would devote yourself to all those training regimes and make all those sacrifices and put in all the hard yards, friends, Paul encourages us to do the same when it comes to godliness. Paul calls this a win-win, a win for this life and a win for the life to come. Now, Paul goes on to say two more things about what a good servant of Christ Jesus does in terms of their lifestyle. Take a look at verse 12. Verse 12, don't don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but instead set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. 
Well, we've come to the turning point of chapter 4. So far, Timothy has been all about exposing error, pointing out lies. And so now from this verse on, Paul wants to encourage Timothy to actually show how good the truth is, to live it out. And here in verse 12 specifically, rather than having others look down on Timothy because of his age, his youthfulness, he wants Timothy, he wants others to look up to Timothy because of the example he sets, because of his speech and because of his conduct. His speech, Paul's not talking there about, you know, Timothy's chit-chat. He's talking about the way that he speaks about Jesus, his God talk. That's to be worth copying. It's not just knowledge for Timothy. No, it's to be the fact that Jesus is real. Jesus makes a difference. Jesus impacts how he conducts himself. It's all the stuff that we saw in last week in chapter 3 about how the truth transforms uh, his view on alcohol or how he relates to outsiders. Does his private and public life match up? I don't know about you, but growing up as a kid, I used to love playing those spot the difference games. Um, They'd often be in the Sunday newspaper or in the puzzle book. And you'd have two identical pictures, right? Side by side. And uh, you'd have to try and circle what was missing from one that was there in the other. So, you know, one picture would have a missing clock on the wall, a missing picture. Uh, In one of the pictures, the guy would be wearing only one sock as opposed to two. Well, when it comes to godliness, sure there might be able, sure we might be able to spot the difference between what we are and what we want to be, but godliness, a good servant of Christ Jesus, is always prepared to know what those things are and to work on them, to name it, to not do pretend, but to be committed to working on closing the gap between those differences. That's why good servants of Christ Jesus pay attention to the way they both speak and to the way they act. Because our lives are on display, aren't they? People are watching. People are copying. Everything from the way that you drive to what you post on social media, uh, how you treat your spouse, what your home life is like, uh, how you use your downtime, uh, how you use your money, how you dress. We have tremendous opportunity, don't we, friends, to help one another train for godliness. You ever think about the last person Uh, the person that you looked up to or you used to look up to when you first became a Christian? You know, who's your Christian role model? You got someone in mind? Well, chances are you picked that person because of the way in which they spoke and because of the way they lived. They were at least um, able to set an example for you in terms of what it looked like to be a follower of Jesus. And so why don't you, before today is out, Why don't you get in touch with them? You know, drop them a text, uh, call them, message them, pray for them. Express your thankfulness to God for them in some sort of concrete way. Well, Timothy is to set an example, not just in speech and conduct. He's to do those things in the context of love, of faith and impurity. See, love is to be behind everything, everything Timothy says and does. He's setting an example for their good. And not only that, when it comes to faith, he's, he's contending, he's pursuing, he's fighting the good fight. Showcasing those things as opposed to what others in this letter are described as doing with, with, when it comes to faith. People like Hymenaeus and Alexander, who we met back in chapter 1, verse 20, guys who've shipwrecked their faith. There's those who have abandoned their faith that we saw in verse 1 of this chapter. Or come chapter 6, verse 10, they'll be greedy who wander away from the faith. No, Timothy is to cling on to the faith. And when it comes to purity, Timothy, like all good servants of Christ Jesus, they're to lead the way. Interestingly, the only other time that purity gets a mention is in chapter 5, verse 2 of 1 Timothy, where Timothy says, is told to treat younger women with absolute purity. Good servants of Christ Jesus relate to members of the opposite sex in wholesome, healthy, appropriate, and God-honoring ways. Now, friends, it dawned on me the other day that well, as I was writing this sermon, that chances are you won't remember any sermon I preach in 10 years' time. And I'm okay with that because chances are I probably won't remember it either. But I'm pretty sure that you'll remember how I've spoken to you if you call MBM home, whether positively or negatively. You'll remember whether I listened well, how I handled a certain situation, whether I understood you, whether I encouraged you, how I served, not just up front but behind the scenes as well. Those of you who've come into my home, you'll, you'll remember how you see me in action 
in front of my kids, in front of my wife. Those things will become a lasting memory more than perhaps any other words that I say in a sermon. And knowing that, knowing that this is the sort of stuff that Paul is talking about here and asking us to pay attention to, that's what inspires me to keep on working on godliness. And I hope it does for you too. Now, part of living a life of godliness, part of living out the truths of godliness, actually Paul picks up on what I've just said in verse 15. That progress, not perfection, is the name of the game. 1 Timothy 4 verse 15. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Notice there's no half measures here. We're to give ourselves wholly, not half-heartedly, so that everyone, not just a few, but that everyone may see our progress. Paul goes all out here. He says, go all in, be diligent, make every effort, get absorbed like you would as you you binge watch the latest TV show, because by doing so, the results will follow. Only in this case, we're not talking about progress in terms of test scores or a bigger paycheck. No, we're talking about progress that has got to do with godliness. We often say here at MBM that as followers of Jesus, we want our best days to be ahead of us, not behind us. And that's because we're all works in progress. We're always striving forward, day after day, year after year. None of us have fully arrived. Uh, Whenever I'm chatting to someone about stepping up to lead, uh, the hesitation pretty much 100% of the time has become this. It's either got to do with doctrine, you know, I don't have all the answers, or it's got to do with lifestyle. I'm not perfect. I don't feel like I'm good enough. Well, this verse should come as a relief, friends. I want to say that is completely normal, And in sense, in many ways, that the pressure is off because perfection is not what we're after, but rather progress. I'm glad that you don't have all the answers because that'll make you hungry to chase after them. And I'm glad that you're not perfect and you know that you're not perfect because none of us are. And you're aware that you need God's help with this. I often say to couples during marriage preparation, you know, the test of a godly marriage will be for your husband to say to you in a year's time to his wife, You know, I feel more respected by you this year compared to last year. And similarly for the wife to say to their husband, you know, I feel more loved by you this year compared to last year. That's progress. Progress is the name of the game when it comes to our sin as well. I would hope that there'd be certain sins, sins that you have put to death now compared to when you you first took the hand of Jesus. I heard someone beautifully and humbly share this week about how there were certain TV shows that he watched when he first became a Christian that he just is clear of right now. He knows not to go down that, that track. We're forever playing the long game, aren't we, when it comes to putting sin to death. Uh, recently, I've been convicted about my prayerlessness, the sin of prayerlessness, the sin of, of shallow, shallow prayer. And so rather being stuck there, what am I to do? Well, I'm to put the work in, to discipline myself, to seek help, so that in six, 12 months, however many months' time, my progress will be evident. And so that brings us to our final verse, verse 16. A good servant of Christ Jesus has also got good self-awareness. Verse 16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. See, godliness is all about keeping an eye on our speech and on our conduct. Because at the end of the day, we realize godliness is very much linked to salvation. Salvation is at stake here. Now, we know from earlier in the letter, there is no no doubt. We cannot and we do not save ourselves. There is only one mediator between God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. But Paul wants to make it clear, we do have a role to play. Just as the hypocritical liar or the false teacher leads people away from salvation, so too the person who takes godliness seriously the person who lines up their walk and their talk with what Jesus is on about. I remember when I first became a Christian, part of, part of me uh, becoming a Christian was seeing a bunch of people who my, my age who took Jesus seriously. And soon enough, it became very clear that they had something that I didn't have. And that's what made salvation attractive. Now, friends, I began by asking you, who do you want to be? Do you want to be a good servant of Christ Jesus? 
Are you willing to train yourself to pursue godliness? Well, if your, if your answer to that question is yes, then that will have tremendous blessings, not just on this life, but in the life to come. It'll have blessings not just for the here and now and for you personally, but it'll have blessings for the church that you're part of too. You know, in the 10 years that I've had the privilege of being part of MBM, I've discovered that chatting to many others who don't call MBM home, that we here at MBM are known for a number of things, a number of wonderful things, a zeal for the lost, Introducing people to Jesus from a range of different backgrounds, seeing them move from death to life, that that's what we're on about. We're known for our diversity. Uh, that, that's probably one of the biggest reputations of MBM, that you know, each Sunday the United Nations descends on Rudy Hill uh, and, um, and that brings me great joy. That's what the first M of MBM stands for, multicultural. But not only that, we're also known for our commitment to the Bible as well. That's what the B stands for. We're devoted to the public reading of Scripture. We're, demo, devo, um, we're committed to preaching and teaching across all ages and stages, kids, youth, adults. And that final M in MBM, ministry. What makes up ministry? Well, it's ministers, isn't it? Servants. More specifically, what we've been looking at today, good servants, good ministers of Christ Jesus. Because without that, we're just a shell of a ministry. All show, no substance. And so I want to... If you call MBM home, I want to put the challenge out before you that whenever someone asks, you know, what is MBM known for? Wouldn't it be wonderful if they say, amongst all those things that we're already known for, that they were to say that MBM is known for truckloads of servants of Christ Jesus. Servants who serve. Servants who set an example in speech and in conduct, in faith, in love, in purity. Servants who take godliness seriously who know that that's the one thing that will transition from this age to the age to come. Servants who are committed to watching their life and doctrine closely. Servants who are keen to make progress. Because at the end of the day, like Paul says in verse 10, this is why we labour and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Saviour of all people. How about we pray to that end, friends? Father God, what a beautiful picture here that you've put before us in 1 Timothy 4. A picture of uh, godliness, a picture of a good servant of Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we would pray that you would help us to play our part, to do whatever it takes, to show to us the areas that need to change, where perhaps our walk and our talk don't line up, and to be committed to those things, to be committed to pursuing those things, to disciplining ourselves, to training ourselves. Father, we pray that in the coming week, in the coming days ahead, especially in the midst of lockdown, that we would be on about training ourselves in godliness, that we would be a bunch of people who, are, who recognize the times that we live in, and now is the time to not only speak the truth, but to live the truth. For we pray this for Jesus' sake, the one who is the saviour of all people. Amen. Well, Jesse, what do you reckon is uh, one thing is that has helped you train in godliness? Mm. One of the most helpful things for me has been being honest and open with other women mm. uh, who can pray for me and also ask me how I'm going in areas that I struggle with. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm. Super helpful having others speak in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, just as we heard earlier from Kim, if, mm. if you are in a position of needing care in any way, mm. uh, physical, uh, food-wise, um, uh, financially, we'd love to hear from you. Get in contact with us at care at mbm.org.au. Yeah. Even if you know someone else who is struggling, also feel free to get in touch with mm. us for the sake of them. Or if you're in a position to help others, we'd love to hear from you. Care at mbm.org.au. Mm. Uh, in light of that as well, we um, continue to thank God for mm. your partnership with us, whether uh, in you know practical ways, but also especially financially. As you partner with us to see things like the care ministry happen, mm. but also to see this ministry continue and others to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus and come to know him and be saved. So we praise God for you mm. and we encourage you to keep giving in that way. Yeah. In just a moment, some questions are going to come up on the screen. But if you have any questions that you'd like to ask about the sermon today, we'd love you to get in touch with us for our Loose Ends podcast. You can do that by sending any questions you have to questions at mbm.org.au. We'd love to hear them. Yeah, great. Yeah. Otherwise... We'll see, see you next soon. week. Yeah.